Ghostbusters 2. Is it really that bad? Yep. The movie is generally seen as a poor sequel to the 1984 blockbuster hit, and a lot say that Ghostbusters 2 follows the same beats as the first movie a little too closely, and I think, yeah, it does in some ways, but is it really that bad? I, for one, have always enjoyed the movie, and never quite understood the hatred it received. I mean, it's no Terminator 2 or Godfather Part 2, that's true, but in my opinion, it is a decent sequel. Ghostbusters 2 had a budget of somewhere between 30 to 40 million dollars and made over 215 million dollars but failed to beat the box office income of the first movie and also had a rushed production compared to the first movie. And it was initially met with poor test screenings resulting in a few scenes being scrapped and new scenes written. In an interview in 2021, Bill Murray said the following, Ghostbusters 2 ended up not being the story they wrote. They got us in the sequel under false pretenses. Harold had this great idea, but by the time we got to shooting it, I showed up on set and went, what the hell is this? What is this thing? But we were already shooting it, so we had to figure out how to make it work. In June 1989, the movie was released and it was met with some criticism. Our next film is Ghostbusters 2, the sequel to the best-selling movie comedy of all time, and it's a major disappointment. And I what's agree so with you completely. This movie is a total disappointment. Mm -hmm. No thought went into it, no effort went into it, there's no comedy in it. Now I can't help but disagree with that review. The movie is actually quite funny. I mean, okay, the writers did stay close to the original movie, but I think there is some cool stuff in the movie that make it stand apart from the original. I'm not saying it does not have its faults. It does, and I'll get into those a little bit later, but does it deserve all the hatred it got? I don't think so. Now, another thing to bear in mind is that since the first movie was released, the animated TV show became a massive success. Every 80s kid knew who the Ghostbusters were, and toys were all over the place. So it was decided to tone down the movie, making the ghost more cartoony and removing adult humour. But if you ask me, they didn't actually tone it down at all. Not that much. Also, there was another movie due to be released that was just around the corner. That may have killed the excitement for the Ghostbusters. I'm Batman. And that was Tim Burton's Batman, which was at the time taking the world by storm as it was one of the first dark series superhero movies we'd ever seen, especially for a Batman project. Batman's become hip and cool and people can come out of the closet and admit that they read Batman. So that would have definitely had an effect on the popularity of this movie, although the movie was not a failure, it made its money back and more, but not as much as the first movie. The movie starts five years after the original movie, and in the opening scene we see a blob of slime seeping through the pavement as a pram wheel rolls over it. The woman pushing the pram is Dana Barrett and we later find out that her and Venkman was an item for a while before they split. She had a child called Oscar with her now ex-husband and fun fact, Oscar was actually played by two twin babies. Now it would seem that the slime that the pram wheel went over somehow possessed the pram which takes off down the street on its own accord and into the road weaving in and out of traffic before stopping just before a buzz nearly hits the baby. Now I love this scene, it's such an edge of your seat kind of scene as the pram narrowly avoids being ploughed into by incoming traffic and I think it was quite a good way to open the movie. Now after the title sequence we quickly find out that the Ghostbusters are no more after being sued by the city for damage caused in the first movie and for some reason they are seen as frauds or tricksters. Oh man, this is so bad. Okay, so let me get this straight. In the first movie, the Ghostbusters defeat a giant marshmallow man which is rampaging through New York City, trampling on cars, knocking over buildings, and they still think it was an illusion? And they're blaming the Ghostbusters who saved the world? And you think this is a good movie? Anyway, after the first movie, the gang all split. Ray is now the owner of a bookstore called Ray's Occult, as well as driving around in a worse for wear XL1 with Winston. The two of them attend birthday parties for kids who don't exactly appreciate them and would rather see He-Man attend the party than the Ghostbusters. And here's a fun fact, Ivan Reitman who directed this movie actually placed his son in this scene and his son would later go on to direct his very own Ghostbusters sequel which is Ghostbusters Afterlife. Egon is now working in a lab looking into human emotions. Fun fact, the little girl in this scene who is playing with the puppy is Ivan Reitman's daughter. And Venkman has used his five minutes of fame to host a TV show called The World of the Psychic. And I thought this was a genuinely funny idea as Venkman interviews the guests who are clearly insane. Well, apart from maybe this guy. I have a strong psychic belief that the world will end on New Year's Eve. 
Well, for your sake, I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah. Now, after Dana had her paranormal experience on the street, she asked for the help of Egon, who brings along Ray, and Peter Venkman invites himself. After running some tests on Oscar, they go out into the street to where the pram suddenly stopped in the middle of the road, only for Egon to discover that there are some very strange readings coming from under the ground. Which leads to the three Ghostbusters illegally digging a hole in the middle of the road and lowering Ray down where he discovers a river of slime in an old unused railway station. And the visuals for this scene are actually quite cool, I do like it a lot, I think for the time it was made it is actually quite good. Now Dan Aykroyd originally had a plot that would see Dana kidnapped and taken to Scotland and held underground by furries and other creatures. And is anyone getting Hellboy 2 vibes from this? Now this idea proved to be too expensive and the idea was ultimately scrapped and the movie was based in New York instead, but some of the underground elements of the first draft did remain in this film with the river of slime running under New York City. And this was done because the slime somehow feeds off people's negative emotions and what better place to do that than in New York City. Now as Ray dangles over the river of slime, the slime actually becomes animated and actually starts to try and grab Ray and this actually freaked me out quite a lot as a kid and it is quite freaky to this day. Now as Egon and Peter bring Ray up, he accidentally kicks a pipe which falls and somehow causes a power cut and it plunges all of New York into darkness. And for this, the three Ghostbusters find themselves in court for causing all the trouble. This is where we get the brilliant inclusion of Rick Moranis who played Louis Tully in the original and in this is reprising his role. He plays the Ghostbusters lawyer who is totally unprepared for this situation. And the fact that the Ghostbusters had him as the lawyer I think was a stroke of genius. I found this so funny and Rick Moranis played this part so well and it was a pleasure to see him return as a friend to the Ghostbusters. And man, like I said, is he funny. He's probably one of the worst lawyers I've ever seen in a movie. I was stuck in an elevator for two hours and I had to make the whole time. But I don't blame them because one time I turned into a dog and they helped me. Thank you. Fun fact, after this movie, the character of Lewis Tully was actually added to the cartoon series because he proved that popular. So in the courtroom is a jar of slime that Ray collected from the underground as evidence. And as Judge Wexler is giving his verdict with some serious negative attitude, the slime seems to react by bubbling violently, causing two ghosts strapped to electric chairs to explode into the courtroom. And they don't seem too happy with the judge who they attack. It turns out that these ghosts were sent to the electric chair by the judge for murder. As the ghosts are causing mayhem, the judge tells the Ghostbusters they need to do something, and they agree as long as the charges are dropped. Then we see Ray, Peter and Egon equip themselves with their proton packs and go about trapping the ghosts. And I absolutely love this scene, it's very exciting to see them back for the very first time in five years. It would have been better if Winston was in this scene, but I suppose he wasn't on trial, so you kind of excuse that. And it's also in this scene that we get one of my favourite gags in the entire movie. Do Ray now another thing I really like about this scene is that the effects are actually really really good taking into consideration the year this movie was made and the fact that the ghosts were puppets, not CGI. And here's another fun fact for you. The Sklolluri brothers may have actually been loosely based on the real life Sklolluri brothers who apparently once robbed the store of Harold Ramis' father. Now after the Ghostbusters successfully trap the ghosts, they burst out of the courtroom and declare that the Ghostbusters are back. And then the movie treats us to a montage of the Ghostbusters getting back to work once again, busting some ghosts and sometimes wearing some brand new outfits that look very swish, although I must admit, I do prefer the beige. Also the Ecto-1, which was a little worse for wear at the beginning of the movie, gets a very nice makeover. Now as the movie goes on, we learn that slime can be affected by negative emotions, giving power to some spooky ghosts. And of course, we also have the main villain, Vigo. Another reason why this movie is so good, due to the fact that this guy is actually very scurry. Now Vigo is a medieval sorcerer who always reminded me of Vlad the Impaler from Dracula, and apparently he was indeed based on this character as well as many others. And here's another fun fact, the actor playing Vigo was actually angered during the showing of this movie after discovering that his voice had been dubbed. Now back to the story, Vigo is now possessing his own painting in the art museum where Dana works. Now I think this actually makes it more scurvy because most of the time Vigo is actually in his painting and every now and again you'll see him crack a creepy smile or move slightly within the frame which makes this all that more scurvy. 
When Vigo makes himself known to Janos, we get Vigo's disturbing dialogue and we learn his desire to live again and to do that he needs a child which turns out to be Dana's child, Oscar. And to add a little bit more background to the character, we also get this disturbing description from Ray. Vigo the Carpathian, born 1505, died 1610. He was poisoned, stabbed, shot, hung, stretched, disemboweled, drawn and quartered. Also known as Vigo the Cruel, Vigo the Torturer, Vigo the Despised and Vigo the Unholy. Now let me remind you, a lot of people believe that this movie was toned down due to the cartoon's success, but if you ask me that simply isn't the case. This movie really does have some truly scary moments with some chilling visuals thrown in for good measure. Let me go through a few of them right now. Now I think one of the most scariest scenes in the movie is when Ray, Egon and Winston are exploring the abandoned railway line, when all of a sudden they are surrounded by a lot of decapitated heads on spikes. <laughs> And this scene is straight up terrifying, especially when you consider that this movie's audience is mainly children. Directly after this happens we see the Phantom Ghost Train which runs right through Winston, which I think is done flawlessly and has a really creepy vibe to it, especially when you hear Egon's theory on what Ghost Train it actually was. It's the old New York Central, city of Albany. Derailed in 1920, killed hundreds of people. Now apparently these scenes were put into the movie late on in production to add more scares and it certainly did do that. It's possibly one of the biggest scares in both movies combined in my opinion. Another scene that was apparently added late on was a scene in where Egon and Ray are developing the photos in the red room and then it suddenly bursts into flames before Winston saves them from burning to death. And this scene also amplified the danger presented from Vigo. And then there's a scene where Oscar has ventured outside of his bedroom window and is standing very close to the edge of the building, which in itself is a horrifying thing, but I think what happens next is truly creepy. In the distance we see an elderly woman who looks like a demonic Murray Poppins with a pram floating towards Oscar through the night sky, who then with glowing red eyes extends the large ghost hand and grabs Oscar and floats away with him in the pram. It is quite a creepy scene. The demonic Murray Poppins actually turns out to be Janos in dress up which always confused me as a kid because Janos isn't dead and this scene clearly shows him as a ghost. I always thought this scene would have been more effective if they actually got an old woman to play the part with some rotting prosthetics on her face and rotten teeth maybe, but nonetheless it was still a very creepy scene. Then there is a very cool shot of the Titanic arriving at the docks and we can see all the ghost passengers walking out of the hole created by the iceberg and it is all very eerie and creepy and it probably works more because it was actually a real life disaster. In the animated series Slimer has a very big role, he's part of the team so to speak, so in Ghostbusters 2 he makes a return, unfortunately mainly in montages where we see that Slimer is now in the firehouse but not exactly welcomed. Now apparently there are a few scenes that were actually cut from the movie involving Lewis Tully and Slimer and I must admit being an 80s kid who loved the animated series it was great to see Slimer return and even as an adult now I would love to see those deleted scenes someday make their way back into an unedited cut of Ghostbusters 2. Now another deleted scene apparently showed Ray driving the Ecto-1 very dangerously whilst possessed by Vigo but for some reason this was also cut and wasn't included. Although elements of this scene still exist in the movie when Venkman reacts to Ray running a red light. Now although I clearly have a lot of love for this movie I do admit that this movie was not perfect. It is kind of a copy of the first movie to some extent but I really do feel that Ghostbusters 2 is different enough to make it stand out on its own. It has a mix of some very cool scenes and some new ideas that I really do believe makes it a very good sequel but there are some faults I do have with the movie although they don't bother me all that much. First of all we see the welcome return of Janine who I actually do love but I must say her character has been drastically changed for this movie, maybe to keep in line with the cartoon but she almost does not seem like the same character from the first movie and she now has a crush on Lewis rather than Egon. Then there's the inclusion of the slime which I don't think is an awful idea but I wasn't completely sold on the idea of the slime being able to animate objects. I mean the toaster jumping around on the table I was okay with, that was fine and I could just about excuse the bathtub monster that tries to grab Dana and Oscar. But the scene I had the biggest issue with was the Statue of Liberty coming to life with the aid of the slime, some good mood and the Nintendo Advantage controller. Even as a kid I couldn't accept how the statue could come alive and actually walk, it seemed a little too far fetched and I know that sounds a little strange about a movie about zapping and trapping ghosts but it never quite worked for me. 
But that being said, it is a fun scene and I still enjoy it to some extent. One of my biggest gripes is the actual ending where we see the Ghostbusters go up against Vigo as he crash through the skylight and save Oscar from the possession ritual. I thought the entrance of the Ghostbusters was good, it's the actual battle that comes after this which I found a little lacklustre as Vigo, who is quite menacing I'll give him that, simply reflects the Ghostbusters proton blasts and paralyses them for a short time. It's only when Vigo hears the people of New York singing outside to welcome in the new year that he begins to weaken and retreats back into his picture. And after possessing Ray momentarily, the Ghostbusters defeat him by blasting him and covering him with positively charged slime. And that's it, it's as simple as that. It's not the worst ending, and like I say, I do still enjoy this movie, but I'd hoped for something more. I also want to briefly touch on the soundtrack, which I think has some very good songs in there, especially the hit song by Bobby Brown on our own, which is actually really catchy and actually incorporates some of the plot of the movie into the lyrics. And man is it so good and I fear slightly forgotten but probably not by you diehard fans. And of course we can't forget the Ghostbusters rap by Run DMC which is also a very good addition. In conclusion I stand by this movie, it's not as groundbreaking as the first which in my opinion is a perfect movie but I think Ghostbusters 2 is a very good sequel. Not perfect, I am aware of its faults but it has some pretty good character development. The more cartoony spooky scenes really do work well, and then when they bring the real scares, they work even better. And then of course we have a full cast of some very funny actors, and some of the jokes don't quite land, but the majority certainly do. And let's face it, it could have been worse. It could have been a lot worse.